So with that, we're going to be looking at a portion of the book of Acts as we've been looking at Acts, and we're in chapter 12, and we're going to be looking today at uh, the first six verses, uh, Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, and I think that this is a portion of Scripture that we'll see has, has practical implication to us believers, even as we are here right now in the 21st century, and as I normally do, I'm going to read the passage from verse 1 to verse 6 to you, and I'm going to share some, some uh, foundational things to uh, bring us up to speed to enter into our study here in chapter 12. And you'll see as we go through these verses that there are going to be verses that I'm going to stop and share some things, hopefully uh, to help us to have some hope and insight into the God that we worship. And so we'll begin reading here in uh, Acts chapter 12 at verse 1. I'll read to verse 6, and we'll get into our study. Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. So let me give you a, 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 an introduction to develop a foundation, and it's going to be basically a couple stages, and so bear with me as I do that. So we'll begin by simply pointing out something that is obvious. History is filled with stories of those who tried to resist God. Resistance to God began first with Satan. He's also known in Scripture as Lucifer, he has various names that, that we know him by, but in Scripture he's also known as Lucifer. We know him best as Satan, we know him best as the devil, but again, he's known as Lucifer. So in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, Isaiah speaks concerning rebellion, his rebellion. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 says, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the, the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will in, sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Lucifer had what is called the five I wills. You see that as I read them to you just now in Isaiah 14. And what it is is Lucifer desired to steal from God the worship that belongs only to him, and he tried to become God. And that's one reason he is referred to as Lucifer. The word Lucifer is actually taken out of the, the Latin translation. It, it, it means uh, morning star, light bearer, or morning star. So what he was trying to do is he was trying to take the title of Christ for himself. You see, Morning Star is a title worn by Jesus in Revelation 22, 16. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. He went on to say, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So a morning star speaks of the first light that appears in the sky just before sunrise. Why would Jesus be called the morning star, the bright and morning star? Well, God created light and in the purest sense, Jesus is the one who brings light. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So in a very real sense, Jesus is a true morning star. He is the light bearer. And Lucifer rebelled. And because he did that, he was cast out of heaven. And it seems as we, we read our scriptures that he incited other angels to rebel along with him. Because in Revelation 12, verse 4, he is described as that the serpent He's a great dragon, and it says his tail swept one-third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. And, and theologians will point out that this one-third would represent 
angels who rebelled along with him. So when he came to earth, he instigated rebellion in the Garden of Eden. He tempted Eve to take of the fruit. Adam partook of it with her. And as a result, we have what is called an Adamic nature. The Adamic nature is what is also called the fallen nature. And fallen man with our fallen nature has rebelled against God ever since. As a matter of fact, our fallen nature is the core of our being. We have sinful natures and we're enemies of God. Sometimes people think that you can train people out of a fallen nature. You cannot train them out of a fallen nature. The nature has to be redeemed. The people have to be born again. And we look at kids and we say to ourselves, how could they be so bad? Because we know they're like their mothers. And that's the answer. That's the Bible. <laughs> now, we have sinful natures because we received them from Adam. In Romans 5 verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. So we men, we have what are called the Adamic nature as well as our wives or girls or ladies and, uh, and all of that. But we all have a fallen nature. Ephesians 2 verse 3 says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. So sadly, those who fight against God in our society, and it's been this way throughout history, are often held up as heroes that you should emulate or be like. Our political and cultural landscape is filled with heroes who are actually rebels against God. The fact is, it's always unwise to fight God. Proverbs 21.30 says, There's no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. In Daniel 4.35, it says, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? So in this chapter, chapter 12, we get a glimpse of a man who's fighting with God. And this man's name is Herod Agrippa I. Now he reigned from 37 to 44 AD. Let me give you a second part of the foundation so you know who we're speaking about here when it says in verse 1, at that time Herod the king stretched out his hand. This portion of scripture occurred in 44 AD. How do we know that? Because it's dated by the death of Herod. Herod Agrippa I was the grandson of one in scripture known as Herod. We also know him as Herod the Great. It is Herod the Great who is known for his work. He was a builder. He was known for his work on the temple. He was also the one responsible for killing the children when Jesus was born. Herod Agrippa's father's name was Aristobulus, who was the son of Herod the Great. Aristobulus was murdered by his own father, and Herod Agrippa was sent to Rome to live. So in AD 37, Rome gave Agrippa rule over northern Israel into Samaria, Judea, which is to the south, as well as across the river Jordan. His father was an Edomite, which is a Jordanian today, his mother's name was Miriam, and she was Maccabean, which is Jewish. So when he arrived at Jerusalem, he acted as he was an observant Jew. And so being seen as devout made him acceptable to the Jewish people. And so this is a person we're looking at right now. He's a person that is in rebellion against God, and we're going to see what takes place here as we enter our study. So it says in verse 1, chapter 12, About that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. He killed James, the brother of John of the sword, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also, and it was during the days of unleavened bread. So at that time, the believers in the church were going through great changes. Now we've been seeing this as we've gone through Acts. There's already been long-standing opposition by Jewish religious leaders. Persecution had erupted. And when persecution had erupted, many of them had begun to travel and spread and preach the gospel in different areas. And as that took place, Samaritans had come to faith in Jesus. And when the Samaritans began to come to faith in Christ, it could have caused some unrest 
amongst the Jewish people because Jews, as we know, had no dealings with Samaritans. Now, on top of that, Gentiles had been brought into fellowship as believers, and that caused believers in Jerusalem to question what was going on, and they wanted to speak to the apostle Peter about that, and we saw that. We saw how Peter came and shared with them what had taken place. So after speaking with Peter about it, the majority had accepted it and even went so far as to glorify God. So in spite of opposition and outright persecution, the church as we see it up to this point continues to grow. Now in Antioch, Syria, which was 300 miles to the north from Jerusalem, many had come to faith in Jesus. We saw last time in chapter 11, verse 21, how it says a great number believed and turned to the Lord. In Acts 11, 24, it says uh, that through Barnabas, many people were added to the Lord. And then in verse 26 of chapter 11, for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. So many people are coming to faith in Christ as this is taking place. So there's no doubt that Herod had heard that Gentiles were joining the church and that was causing unrest. He could also please the Sadducees. Now the Sadducees were opponents of the body of Christ. It was the Sadducees who tried to keep the believers from preaching the gospel. They even went so far as commanding us, commanding them as believers not to preach. But they kept doing so. Remember that they jailed the apostles for preaching and an angel had broken them out. When they once again took them into custody, they said to them in Acts 5.38, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. So there was a lot of opposition. The people were getting upset over the fact that Samaritans were being ministered to. The people who were uh, hearing in the church that Gentiles were coming to faith were having difficulty. There's a lot of unrest that's taking place. And so while this is happening, happening, Herod Agrippa is working hard to maintain good relationship with the Jewish people. So one way to receive favor was to persecute Christians, especially the leaders. So he harassed the church. He killed James, the brother of John. Now, Jesus had made it clear that martyrdom was something his people had to prepare for. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 18, Jesus said, Behold, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and be as innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to their councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. In John 16, verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. So what he does is he stretches out his hand and he's harassing some from the church. Now he would have been doing that at first through his soldiers, perhaps some servants. They began to abuse believers. They were striking them. Sometimes they may have even broken up worship services. They came in and disturbed them and they were making it very difficult for believers to live in peace. And so that was taking place then. That kind of thing takes place now. It's nothing new. Uh, I I recently read that governments and major corporations often shut down the speech of Christians in support of secularization, along along with upholding the views of the LGBTQ plus community and other minorities that disagree with the Christian worldview. So we know that takes place now. We know that under COVID and all of that, there are restrictions and regulations. We have seen the, that attempt to shut down the, the voice of the church. That's nothing new. But what is he doing? Well, it says in verse 2, he killed James, the brother of John with the sword. So it, it got worse than simply the harassing. Now it's killing. And he killed James. He beheaded him. That's what it means that he He killed James with a sword. He beheaded him. Now that gives us some insight, by the way. It reveals that it was under Roman law that he was put to death for what would have been called a civil infraction. If if it would have been a Jewish method of of capital punishment, it would have been for blasphemy or heresy, it would have been that he had been stoned to death. So this tells us that it was a civil infraction. And so it says, 
he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now again, who is James? Now James was the brother of the apostle John. He was also Jesus' cousin. James was one of Jesus' closest apostles along with Peter, John, and Andrew. He was with Jesus when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, as you see in Mark 5. He also was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus was transformed before him, transfigured before them, and they saw his glory, as it's recorded in Matthew 17. He was one of the three who went further into the garden with Jesus and the night that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He also stands out for a nickname that Jesus gave to him, he and his brother. He called them sons of thunder. Now that's interesting. I've read different reasons why he may have been called son of thunder. There are those who say, well, he was called a son of thunder because prophets were known to speak in a way that was thundering. Well, that may be so, but he also probably had a temper. And so this is a man, well, how do I know that? Well, I'll tell you why. On one occasion, Jesus was going through a Samaritan village. He was going to go through it. And he sent James and John, you remember the story, to prepare, but the people rejected well, in Luke 9, 54, when the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? That's a kind person. Now, there have been times when somebody cuts me off in traffic. Would you send fire from heaven and destroy them? You know not what spirit you're of. But it shows you something of the temperament of these people. Now, one of the things that stands out about him is this, his ambition. Remember, he and his brother had sought prominence in Jesus' coming kingdom. Lord, what happened is you know, the mother came and spoke to Jesus and said, I have something to ask you. Uh, would you grant that my sons may sit, one on the right hand, one on the left, when you enter into your kingdom? You remember that. And so Jesus responded to that request it's recorded in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 10, verses 38 and 39, by saying, you do not know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I will drink or be baptized with the baptism I will undergo? We can, the brothers answered. You will drink the, the cup that I drink, Jesus said. You will be baptized with the baptism that I undergo. So what happened? Well, the fulfillment of this prophecy was James being the first apostle who was martyred. In the case of John, he was the last survivor. Now, it's interesting, an apostle is martyred, and nothing's really said about it. More attention was given to Stephen's death than the death of James. Little is said of his death, but the one that matters took note of it. In Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord, is the death of his saints. And so he reaches out. He begins by harassing some from the church. He sees that nobody's responding, so he kills James. And then in verse 3, because he saw that it pleased the Jews, speaking of the Jewish authorities and perhaps some of the population, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. And so it begins to escalate. It begins with harassment. Then it begins with him beheading, and now he reaches out for the other uh, apostle, the apostle Peter, in order that he might be able to proceed further. He's becoming bold in his persecution. Now, he's arresting Peter because it pleases Jewish opponents. He, he wasn't necessarily an activist against the church. What he was is a politician He's wanting favor from the people as well as religious rulers. Now, I want to develop that thought for just a moment. We wouldn't expect anything of him other than what he did. Scripture refers to us as temporary residents on planet Earth. This is something I want to talk about for a minute. Scripture refers to us as temporary residents on Earth. We ought not to be surprised when we're rejected. We ought not to be surprised and even government entities are, in oppon are opponents of our faith. We shouldn't be surprised by that. The Apostle Peter in chapter 2, verse 11 of 1 Peter said this. He said, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. 
Now, Peter was writing concerning the hostile attitude of unbelievers towards Christians. As he was writing this, Christians were being persecuted. And so he's saying, even though you are being persecuted, be careful with the way you act. Guard your conduct. They were being rejected. They were being slandered. Remember last week I was speaking to you, they were actually being um, persecuted for being Christians. They suffered as Christians. And I mentioned to you that the word Christian means the one who is owned by or possessed by Christ. And I was sharing with you that that was a slam. It was a slur. To be called a Christian was to be called a slave. And during that day, one of the lowest things you in their economy and society could be was a slave. So in Antioch, they first called them Christians, not because they were identifying them, because normally they were members of the way or they were believers or, or whatever. There were different ways to speak of us. But there they're using a nickname. There they're slandering them. There they were persecuting. And that's why the Apostle Peter said, if you suffer as a Christian, because it was something that was taking place at that time. The government was against Christians during the writing of 1 Peter, and Nero was a fanatic antichrist. And so during that day, they were going after them to destroy them. So he's saying believers are to remain strong by remembering who they are. He said, we are sojourners. The word sojourner speaks of a temporary resident, and a sojourner is one without the rights of citizenship. We are also called pilgrims. The word pilgrim speaks of the person who is wandering, the person who is traveling. He doesn't have a home. He's not at home in the country that he's in. So Peter was saying, and this is important to think of right now, Peter is saying Christians have no permanent home on earth. Our citizenship is not here. We are merely passing through. We need to remember that because some of us seem to think that this is our permanent home. We're passing through. When I first got saved, <clears throat> there were artists who liked to draw different things to kind of imprint us with ideas. And one of them was a guy taking a walk, and you see his, wa his foot walking out, and it, would, it, just, it said, just passing through. We needed to remember that. Why? Because it's easy for us to get enslaved to the materialism and the culture of the age. It's easy for us as believers to begin to become so uh, lukewarm in our faith that we just basically adapt to the things that are being done around us. And so if those people are doing it and they go to church and they're still going to heaven, why can't I do that? And so at one time when you got saved and you said, I'm not going to smoke dope anymore, I'm not going to get drunk anymore, I'm not going to uh, go party anymore, I'm not going to sleep around anymore, I'm not going to be losing my temper anymore, I'm not going to be fighting with anybody anymore, I'm going to change my life, my life's going to be different, people will know that. Well, we used to be to we're told Christ is coming at any time, so we were being prepared and we were awaiting him, but he didn't come in a week, he didn't come in a month, he didn't come in a year. We stopped going to church as often as we did. We stopped going to Bible studies. We stopped serving. We stopped doing those things. Before you know it, we've been infiltrated by the culture of the world. And we become like the world. And so we need to remember that there is mortal combat taking place. We need to remember that the enemy is after us. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we need to be aware that we are citizens of heaven and not citizens of earth. We're just passing through. In Philippians 3.20, it says our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. That simply means we should not regard earth as our home. We have to be careful to travel light and not overpack. So, here's an illustration. My wife's not here. Let me tell it to you. Actually, see, she's here. We're going to go for three days somewhere. I can take a backpack and then two big 60-pound luggage because we're going, after all, for three days. And you've got to have all of this stuff in case. You know, so Marie had to learn to pack light. You know, guys, a lot of guys, I know not every guy, but a lot of guys, we can just put, we're only going to go for three days. We can put just the bare necessities. We do that. We travel light. 
If you're going somewhere, especially if it's going to take some effort on your part or it calls for some sacrifice, say that you're going to go up in the hills, you're going to do a hiking trip to a particular place, you're not going to carry a large uh, you know, rolling luggage up the hill. You're going to put it on your back if you can. You're going to travel light. But a lot of Christians don't. A lot of Christians are carrying a lot of baggage. They're carrying things with them. Oh, I need this, and I've got to have that, and I want this. And what happens is we overpack And so, if we're aware of the fact that we're passing through, that means we're going to travel light. That means we're going to be aware of the things that are around us, and we're going to seek something more than the right here and right now. We're going to be seeking first the kingdom of God. Now, the fact is, the lust for power often drives politicians what at one time might have been a noble desire to care for, for people can be, can be transformed into a lifestyle where you don't even remember the people, where you're not even aware of their needs. And again, you know, without trying to offend anybody, it's just the truth. Uh, there are a lot of people who, for example, with the gasoline prices and things, just, just for general things that are going on right now, they... Uh, Many of our politicians don't even drive themselves anywhere. And the gasoline that's being put in the vehicles that drive them, you're paying for. I'm paying for it through our taxes. So they're not pulling out their their card and paying for gas and at the end of the month having to pay that bill off. They don't have to do that. And when they go out to eat, they're not thinking, what can I afford today? I've got four kids and and, uh, my family. And, and my goodness, when we look at the cost, because Marie and I will go every week to, to, to grocery shop and all of that, and you'll look at milk, and it's going up and up and up. Even milk itself or bread, and you'll look at it and you say, when they say it's going to cost you $110 to make a bologna sandwich, you think, my goodness, <laughs> that's a lot. You know what I'm talking about. It's true. I mean, you go and you put gas in the car, and you just watch that thing just spinning, and you're saying... You know, just three years ago, it was two seventy nine a gallon. And now it's six-something a gallon. And, and we know these things. But, but those who are, quote-unquote, representing us as servants to the people, they don't. They don't have an idea. So they get in a big plane. They fly wherever they want. They do what they say. And they say, oh, I'm a person of, of the people and all of that. But you have never even actually paid your own bill for your own meal. You don't have a clue what's going on. Politicians, and I'm set to say there are godly politicians. I'd like to meet one, but there are. I believe that there are who really do care, but they're few and far between because the lust for power is that immense and the inability to communicate and understand what somebody else goes through is that they become almost invulnerable to those things. And that's just a fact, and we know that. And so the lust for power often is the driving force behind their decisions. In 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So as believers, we're careful to seek first the kingdom of God. We do exercise our God-given rights, but we remain aware that we're rejected by the world. In John 16, 33, these things I've spoken to you, Jesus said, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so that's where our hope is, because there is an array of enemies, spiritually, opponents of the gospel, and it's been for for centuries. Now, by now, the apostle Peter, who's being arrested, again, verse 4, when he had arrested him, by now, he's becoming familiar with jail. I used to call him a jailbird because this this is his third arrest in the book of Acts. He was arrested in chapter 4 as well as chapter 5. So Herod had arrested James, and now he arrests the apostle Peter. To gain greater favor, he arrested Peter during the days of unleavened bread, the scripture says. Now that's a week-long feast immediately following Passover. So there would be crowds that were gathered, and the larger the crowd, the better his image to the Jewish people. So verse 4 says, when he had arrested him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So four squads 
Each squad was composed of four soldiers, so there were 16 guarding him, and he was placed in prison to await his execution after Passover, or what is commonly called today Easter. They normally would not execute anyone during a religious festival. And so Peter's in jail. Notice verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Constant. When it says constant prayer, the word constant speaks of persistent and fervent prayer. Peter was in prison, but constant prayer was offered. So in, instead of protesting the unfair treatment, they took this to God. The church knew only God had the power to set him free. And with great agony, they petitioned the Lord for his safe rescue. Now James 5.16 says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now we've seen that prayer is one of the building blocks of the early church. They were devoted, devoted to the word. They were devoted to uh, uh, fellowship, to communion, and to prayer. That was the mark of the church in Acts 2.42. And so the people had seen God answer prayer, and so fervent prayer is being offered up on behalf of him. Now, in chapter 4, we saw how the church reacted when opposition first began. Remember how the Sadducees were upset that Peter was preaching the resurrection. So they arrested Peter and John and forbade them from preaching. But after release, they went back to the companions and they reported all that had happened. And when they began to report, it prompted the people to pray. In Acts 4, 25 and 26, they said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And so they're quoting scripture. Why are the people raging? But they went on in Acts 4, 29 and 30 to ask God to look upon the threats. They asked him to grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Once again, the church begins to pray fervently and they're praying on behalf of the apostle. They're meeting in the house of Mary, the mother of Mark. And as this is taking place, verse 6 says, when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. He was bound with two chains, but notice with me, he's asleep. He's sleeping between two soldiers. There are also two guards that are posted at the door. Now, obviously, Herod was taking no chances that any sympathizers might break in and set him free. But I want to develop something with you, and this is pretty much the heart of what I wanted to say. I want you to notice that Peter was calm enough to sleep. That reminds me of how Jesus was asleep during a storm on the lake. In Mark 4, it tells us how Jesus was in a boat and a storm arose, and the storm was bad enough to almost swamp the boat. During the excitement, Jesus was in the back of the boat and he was asleep. The fact that he was asleep bothered his men. And they woke him up and they said, don't you care that we're perishing? And in Mark 4, 39 and 40, Mark tells us he got up, he rebuked the wind, he said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, it was completely calm, and he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Why are you so afraid? We're sitting here soaked to the bone. The waves were crashing over the, the ship. We thought we were going down. I mean, the water is still dripping off of us. Even though the storm is gone, the storm in our heart isn't. Why are you saying to us why we were afraid? We were afraid because we were going to die. I was sharing just the other day. With the church, I said, and many of you already know the answer, but I said, what is in the Bible, what is the opposite of love? Now, in our culture, if I said, what is the opposite of love, what is it? It's hate. People say it's hate. 
What is the opposite of love? They'll say immediately, they'll say, the opposite of love is hate, and the Bible doesn't teach that. What is the opposite of love? The opposite of love is fear. Why? Because fear has torment, and he who fears has not been made perfect in love. What is the opposite of love? Fear. And what does Satan use in our lives the most? Fear. He, he controls us because when we have fear and we take our eyes off of God, the only thing I can see is the storm. The only thing I can see are the waves. The only thing I can hear is the sound of the wind. The only thing I know is I'm about to die because I've taken my eyes off the Lord and I think he's sleeping and I begin to say within my heart, are you, are you asleep? Uh, aren't you, why don't you care that I'm going through this? How come you aren't aware? How come you're not awake? How come you're not doing something? And so... Peter had to learn a lesson like that because Jesus stood up and he told the storm to be quiet and be still like you would a naughty child who was running around the house. Be quiet and be still. And Jesus did that to the waves. He controlled it. And, and Peter was there. Peter saw it. Peter was part of that. And he saw how the Lord silenced the storm. He was able to silence the storm before he silenced their storm. They had a storm, he had a silence. And that's why he said to them, why are you afraid? Why do you have no faith? Why did you doubt? I had said, we're going to go to the other side. I can rest while we do. But you, in the middle of the road, you want to say he's not here. You want to say he's not helping. Why? Because he didn't do it on my timetable? Because he didn't do it the way I said he, he should? Because he's not moving the way I think he should? And that's where a lot of people fail in their walks is that they think God should do it the way he the way they want him to do it. And so we say, how come you didn't deliver me? I can tell you that the Lord will work in his time. It's always his time. There are things that you've gone through that you wish you'd never gone through now. But I promise you in the future, if you hold fast to the Lord in the future, you're going to say, I learned so much from those times. That's where I learned. Uh, I, I said I could walk through the valley of the shadow of death because I could quote the psalm. But when I began to walk in that valley is when I discovered your rod and your staff. They do comfort me. I, I, that's when I realized you were going to take me by the rivers of still water. That's when I knew you were going to take care of me. That's where I knew that, 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 that you were going to bless me. And see, a lot of times when we're in the middle of the storm, a lot of times when we're, when we're being shackled like Peter is between two guards with two standing at the door saying, you're not going to get out. Instead of sleeping, we're weeping. Instead of trusting, we're fearing. And, and that's not true with him. He simply slept. Why? Because he remembered what Jesus said. He trusted his word. Now remember, he had gotten the message to trust God, like it says in Isaiah 26, 3, where it says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You will keep him in complete peace whose mind is resting in you because he's confident in you. The psalmist said in Psalm 3, verse 5, I lie down in sleep. I awake again for the Lord sustains me. And that's what you learn. I can sleep in the midst of a storm. I can sleep when I'm in a situation that I don't want to be in, not because I am apathetic, but because I know I can't do anything, but I trust the one who can. And that's how it works. He trusted in God's promise. What promise? Well, Jesus had made it clear. He's going to grow to be an older man. How do we know that? How do you know that? John 21, verse 18 Jesus speaking to the apostle said this, most assuredly I say unto you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. When you are old, Peter wasn't old. So Peter knew God is going to break about. God is a God who does jailbreaks and is going to break him out. And by the way, through this experience, he was later able to encourage believers. He said in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him. Why? For he cares for you. For he cares for you. In a time when he wrote this, when Nero was wreaking havoc on the church, when persecution was intense, when people were suffering for being Christians, Peter was able to say, cast your cares on him. Why? He cares for you. 
You see, Peter had been in jail before, but he got an early release. In Acts 5.19, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought him out. And he knows God is able to set me free again. When you feel like you're in a prison, and sometimes emotionally we do, I may be speaking to somebody right now who is in a prison, literally. When you're thinking you're in a prison, God is able to take you out. God is able to set you free. And even if you remained in that prison, he still set you free. Because it's not the walls that keep you in, it's yourself. And when you're free in Christ, you're free indeed. So no matter where you are, you're always free. You need to remember that. You remember that. Peter knew he wasn't to die. Jesus said, you'll grow to be an old man so he could trust his word. Isn't that something we all have to do? Is trust his word.